Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Ward 6 City Hall Community Meeting. My name is Victoria McGregor, and I'm the coordinator of the City Hall Community Meetings. It's great, um, it's great to see you, and thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules to be here with us. And a special thank you to Somerville Community Baptist Church for welcoming us back to host this meeting. Um, if this is your first meeting with us, the City Hall community meetings are meant to be a gateway meeting between City Hall and Somerville residents. Staff have prepared updates for you on their current work tonight, both in Ward 6 and citywide. After each presentation, we'll take a few initial questions. If we don't get to your question initially, please hold on to it as we have a dedicated Q&A portion following all presentations. I do want to note that tonight's meeting is being recorded. All board recording or all board meeting recordings will be available online at the conclusion of all City Hall community meetings after Monday, May 22nd. Recordings will be on the City TV government YouTube channel and on the city website at somervillema.gov forward slash community meetings. Before diving into some quick updates I have for you all, I wanted to highlight um, our email address specifically for these meetings. If you prefer email as a way for asking questions or giving feedback, please email cm at summervolume.gov and we'll direct your comment to the appropriate department. We also have multiple city departments here tonight that are not all presenting. Um, you can visit them in the back corner there. Um, we have active surveys going on, um, two in particular. Our Office of Sustainability and Environment has a climate survey going on. Our Department of Racial and Social Justice. Um, there, the Americans with Disabilities Act survey is ongoing and we are welcoming your submissions. Please feel free to go say hi and if you haven't already grabbed a copy of tonight's slides, those are right by the food. Next slide. So for quick updates, um, as you may have know, as you may know, earlier this year, Somerville announced its first ever participatory budgeting process, which will allocate one million dollars in funds for a variety of city improvement projects. Community members ages 12 and up can now submit ideas for funding online, by the phone, by calling or on the phone by calling 311, and in person at City Hall and all library branch locations. If you visit summervillemay.gov/pb. You'll find an interactive map with ideas submitted so far, and you can leave additional feedback. The deadline to submit ideas is Saturday, May 20th. You can also apply now to be a budget delegate volunteer. This group um, will review the ideas uh, submitted by the community and take a vote on, or decide which ones will be put to final vote later this year. The deadline to apply to be a budget delegate is also May 20th. Over multiple weeks, the city and the Somerville Arts Council launched the next phase of the cultural capacity plan that included a series of com uh, community conversations to discuss how we can help arts and culture thrive in Somerville. These conversations ran through May 6th and were led by cultural ambassadors organized by interest groups such as dance, music, literary arts, as well as identity groups. We encourage you to attend the citywide forum on May 23rd at the Armory Building to learn more about the themes that resonated across these conversations. To learn more about the capacity plan as a whole, please visit somervillearcouncil.org forward slash cultural capacity. Yep, thank you. Um, a reminder that the city has multiple spaces dedicated to teens, including the Edgerly Teen Center, Powder House, and the Teen Room at the Somerville Public Library. All are free and have regular, regular schedules with a variety of pro, pro, uh, programming for all interests. Schedules are listed on the slide. Some general election reminders. This table on the left includes several key dates for the upcoming 2023 election season including deadlines to apply to vote by mail, tentative early voting dates, and election dates. Now is a great time to review your voting plans and to make sure all information is up to date. We'd also like to remind you to fill out the annual city census if you haven't already. Completion of the census keeps you listed as an active voter, 
which makes for a seamless voting experience while protecting your right to any veteran bonuses, subsidized housing, or other related benefits. For more information on that, you can visit SomervilleMay.gov slash elections. Somerville's Anti-Displacement Task Force is expanding and is now accepting applications for new members to serve on one of three committees focused on residential, small business, and cultural displacement. Applications are being accepted until all seats are filled. You can learn more by using the QR code here, which is also included in copies of the print of this presentation. Uh, next slide. Uh, these next two slides highlight some um, recent affordable housing investments made by the city. Again, please feel free to grab a copy of the slides to review those at home. The city has fully committed all $77.5 million of ARPA funds. Those are American Rescue Plan Act funds. Not all, okay, not all allocations have been announced yet, but will be soon. On the next slide, you'll find a list highlighting our recent ARPA investments. If you'd like to learn more, please visit summervillema.gov forward slash ARPA, A-R-P-A. Um, from roadway and sidewalk improvements to sewers and storm drains, efforts to maintain, improve, and modernize our city's infrastructure are underway across the city through Somerville's Department of Infrastructure and Asset Management. On the construction page, you can also sign up for the monthly construction newsletter, which has relaunched as of last month. You can sign up to receive a monthly email update on work across the city and on the construction webpage, which is summervillemaine.gov forward slash construction. While this will be a little frustrating for many, uh, we've received an update from the MBTA on the opening of the community path. The, MBA, the MBTA contractor is actively working on the remaining construction, while, um, which includes fencing, lighting, and grading. Work is scheduled to be completed in June of this year. To keep up to date on all things community path, please use the QR code. To highlight some construction projects specific to Ward 6, Davis Square traffic signal upgrades will begin in July of this year. Upgrades include replacement of signal equipment, eliminating, eliminating pedestrian and vehicle conflicts at crosswalks like Dover and Highland, and to improve MBTA bus service using GPS detection of approaching buses. The project is scheduled to be completed in November of this year. We also wanted to touch on the chiller replacement project happening at the Kennedy School. Uh, the Kennedy School has been using a temporary chiller for cooling since last spring. Project, the project is currently underway to replace the chiller with a sustainable permanent cooling system. Construction is set to begin this summer and the new system is expected to be operational by spring of 2024. With that said, what should you expect? Contractors will be on site with construction hours being between 7, and 7 a.m. and 2 p.m. Construction will be taking place in the penthouse and on the rooftop. If you have additional questions on this project, please email capitalprojects at summervillemay.gov. Just a few more, I promise. Um, after more than a year of community engagement, research, and analysis, the city has released its first ever citywide bicycle network plan. The plan is an 88-mile network, including a mixture of protected bike facilities, off-street paths, and traffic-calmed backstreet neighborways to be installed over the next 20 years. The city will continue to hold public engagement processes before installing any facilities uh, identified in the plan and expects to reevaluate it every five years. Future engagement projects will be announced through the city's main communication channels. To read more on the bicycle network plan, please visit summervillemay.gov slash bike network. So there's a lot of events going on in the next few months. I just wanted to highlight two that are coming up relatively soon. First up is Porch Fest this weekend, and then the um, Memorial Day Parade on Sunday, May 28th, back for the first time since 2016. The rain date for that is Monday, May 29th. 
You can keep up to date with all things City of Somerville by subscribing to our weekly newsletter. You can do this by using the QR code on the slide or by visiting somervillema.gov slash subscribe. On this webpage, you'll find a list of other departments that have their own newsletters. We welcome you to, to subscribe to any and all that interest you. Um, for those who prefer the web, the city actively posts on three main social media feeds, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Follow us on your platform of choice to get city updates. That concludes our quick updates portion of this presentation, and I'd like to welcome Mayor Ballantyne to the podium. Thank you, everyone. Let me uh, just adjust this, see if we can get this down. Okay, what I'd first like to do is introduce your ward counselor, Lance Davis. And Lance, if you want to say a few words. Thank you, Mayor Valentine. Um, I'll be very brief. Welcome, everyone. Love to see the packed room. Um, it just goes to show how much more we need community space uh, in this ward and across the city. Um, and uh, really looking forward to uh, all the information the, the one thing I'll specifically plug are the newsletters uh, that were just noticed, um, just listed up there. When I started this job almost eight years ago, the, the way that the city communicated was, was not what it is now. And, and we pushed really hard, um, then Councilor, now Mayor Ballantyne, and I and our others, to, along with the communication staff, to develop these newsletters. And they're really the best source of information. So if you're not signed up for them, get signed up for them. There's a few different ones um, that are subject specific, but they're a fabulous source of information. They are the best way to keep track of what's going on in the city. So um, sign up for those. Otherwise, um, like I said, I'll keep it brief, because there's lots of information here. I'll be hanging around if anyone has questions afterwards. But uh, welcome. Thanks for, thanks for coming. And uh, look forward to it. Thank you, Councillor Davis. I also want to acknowledge that Councillor at Large Kristen Strezzo is in the audience. Thank you. So, you know, I'm really excited. I'm actually thrilled to be here uh, tonight because it's, um, it's just great to be able to see people in person. And I, I hear a lot from people. I hear from people because they call my office, I, they send me emails, or I have conversations on the sidewalk. So uh, I was hoping that, you know, just to start things off is I, we could just see who else is in the room today since we're in person. So I just would ask, you know, raise your hand when I ask a, a question. So if this is your first City Hall community meeting. Raise your hand, please. Wow, wonderful. Thank you for coming. So would you raise your hand if you've lived here less than a year? OK. Would you raise your hand if you've lived here less than three years? Okay. Less than five? Less than 10? Less than 15? 20, less than 20, raise your hand. Okay, if you've lived here over 20 years, raise your hand. Okay, if you've lived here your entire life, raise your hand. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Um, if you're a parent of a child in the Somerville Public Schools, raise your hand. Okay. Um, so why don't I throw it out to you, to you all. Is there a question you want to know about who's in the room? Who are the renters? Okay. So if you are a renter, please raise your hand. Okay. Great. Well, thank you again so much for coming here. I would also like to introduce, there are a lot of city staff people here, and I would really appreciate if city staff would stand up and also raise your hands. So stand up, please. So I'm just going to say, I'm going to go around, stay standing and raise your hand. So urban forestry, elections, capital projects, mobility, uh, um, the director, uh, executive director of the uh, strategic Jeez, it's OSPCD, Strategic Planning and Community Development. Um, capital projects. I can't, you know my, I, pardon? Engineering. Engineering. Economic development. Economic development. Sustainability Okay. Planning, preservation, and zoning. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, Just say. Events and education. Okay. Over here. Yes. 
<laughs> okay, police and fire, Brian. Okay, we have our comms department here. Did I miss anybody? Okay, oh, <laughs> Council on Aging. Sorry. Racial and social justice. Art and Friends in Public Space, Urban Forestry. Okay. All right, great. So I just want you to know who's in the room. So as we go on, oh, thank you. That, uh, you know, if you have questions, you know, if, uh, throughout the evening, please feel free. This is why city staff are here. So I also wanted to, to share uh, the indirect ways that I hear from uh, staff, and that is um, by reviewing our 311 calls. So for the first uh, three and a half months of the year, we had over 17,000 calls to 311. Um, these are, you know, about parking permits. You can see the numbers here, mattress pickups, you know, potholes, Council on Aging information, rat sightings, uh, one of my favorites. <laughs> So what I wanted to share with you is that I'm listening. And I take your words with me, whether it's because I've had a conversation with you or it's been an email or it's been indirectly uh, through 311 calls, is I bring uh, these to our policy meetings, to uh, program planning sessions and budget discussions. And tonight I wanted to share back with you how we balance all of these different needs, priorities, and requests. So what is the usual role of municipal government? Um, some cities and towns think of it as core functions. You know, basic services like police, fire, schools, uh, picking up trash. Uh, and some cities and towns stop there uh, because they believe that's what their community needs or their finances don't allow them to do anything more. In Somerville, we believe we can and we should do more. So I just want to emphasize here that not all cities and towns do what we do. Um, we try to interject creative ways to do more. Um, in part from all of you is we're always aspiring to do more. And we have to focus on both um, two things. Next slide, please. We spend every day focusing on the best quality core services and initiatives that invest in our people, our quality of life, and social progress. And we spend a lot of time trying to think creatively how we do more. And that's how we get to the depth and breadth of what the city does and has expanded greatly in the recent years. So this slide will show you 10 years ago, our operating budget was about 185 million. Today it's about 308 million. 10 years ago we had about 24 departments. Now we have over 60 departments. Next slide please. However, our ability to grow is not given because uh, we're limited by revenue opportunities. Uh, we can't increase our operating budget year over year more than two and a half percent. That's known as Proposition Two and a Half um, plus new growth. Um, our state aid that we get through the state is less, and um, at the same time, you know, we we we're constrained in those financial ways but we have really, really ambitious planning goals. So like Assembly Square, our new high school, doing work on Somerville Ave. Um, and I just wanted to share with you how our revenue has changed over time. So in FY07, you know, um, state, we see the, the shift of more reliance on property tax revenue. 50% uh, back in 2007 of our revenue of property tax and 30% was from state aid. And now that's shifted. Uh, and fortunately for residents, that includes um, commercial 
property tax, which has been growing by design intentionally here in Somerville. On this slide, this, this allows us to look at the past five years where we've added record property values, which allows the city to fund new programs and services. Notice the orange bars. That's the commercial growth that our strategic plan known as Summer Vision has, um, has envisioned for residents. We tried to chart a path that would allow us to invest in our community. That's what brought in the new revenue stream. And that's what allow, has allowed us to continue to invest without burdening our residents. You don't see this in every community. And in fact, Somerville had the third most new growth in the Commonwealth in the last fiscal year. And the biggest impact we can have and are able that allows us to invest in people who live here now is from this new commercial growth in the transform squares of the city uh, has allowed. It diversifies our revenue, it creates jobs for people, and it allows us to do more for our community. How are we overcoming the challenges of doing more? For one, we're investing in our community and drawing out investments to diversify our tax revenue. We're also in a good financial uh, position because we've carefully managed our revenues. Uh, this is in due to you know, the city council, my predecessor, and also um, our financial staff um, by establishing healthy reserves. We've been able to use these in support of our residents and to garner lower borrowing rates. And finally, another strength we have, and this is really true, is we can do more because our community supports our investments, like in infrastructure, social services, in schools, in housing stability, investments that help lift everyone up. Here's a sampling of what some of those investments over the past decade have included an Office of Housing Stability, a Department of Racial and Social Justice, um, a Summer Beaver, an Office of Immigrant Affairs, also have grown recently um, to meet the demand. We have a Fields Maintenance Division, an Office of Emergency Management, separate Building and Grounds Division, Divisions of Mobility, Public Space, Urban Forestry, Web Services, and more. Somerville also has other tools and methods that allow us to do more. Our community has put in linkage and zoning requirements on a range of, a range of development projects that automatically build funding or resources for us. This allows us to do housing, job training, um, open space, arts, and more. We also have inclusionary housing requirements that mandate 20% of all new housing units in housing projects with four or more units are affordable. That delivers on the affordable housing um, to the community without requiring city funds to be invested. And we have aggressively pursued federal, state, and private grants, and our state and federal delegation works hard also to direct supports to us. Here are a few other ways um, of approaches where we've supported affordable housing. And um, we have currently in the pipeline over 700 housing units. We have 6.3 million in federal housing grants this past year. Um, we have $20 million coming in for uh, housing linkage. What that means is when there's a new development, large development coming in in the transform areas, they're required to contribute to a fund for housing. And this is for affordable housing. So the growth projections of the city is anticipating that in the next, or I should say is in the pipeline, we know this money is coming in the, the next five years uh, is 20 million. And we've had recent investments you know, in the last eight months of 
37 million in housing. And some of the programs we've been working on just this year have been um, groundbreaking for Somerville, including our municipal voucher program that will provide some stability for our most vulnerable renters and our acquisition fund that allows our affordable housing trust fund to jump into the market and compete more easily to buy land or buildings that can be repurposed for affordable housing projects. And um, not every community can make these kinds of moves because um, their community um, has not necessarily expressed you know, an interest. Somerville is, has been a very compassionate, uh, forward-thinking community to make sure that we also invest in people. Next up is you know, our arts, and we call it ACE. So that stands for, it's a mouthful, arts and creative enterprises. And it's a set aside, uh, it's another tool um, that we use that is trying to address the community need. Um, it requires that larger developments in certain zoning districts donate 5% of new space for arts and creative uses. This is a game changer. We expect that we will be um, have uh, on the market ready over 500,000 square feet in the next four to five years because that's in the process. So the idea is that the arts and the, the creative enterprises that you all and we all value here will continue to have a home here. This will help artists and makers continue to thrive and avoid displacements. It will also open up a whole lot of new possibilities for arts and cultural opportunities for the public. And this gain was possible by the city just making small investments in staffing and making a zoning change. What are some additional strengths that enable us to do more? Our staff. No. I introduced you to them, but it, it's it's our staff. Um, I, I have to give you another. They they work uh, long hours, um, meet with lots of constituents, residents, uh, to really um, make you feel that you're listened to, that you're valued, because that's what we all want here and really, you know, demand. Um, and another secret, and I sort of said this earlier, is you all, um, because you're engaged. You're also our brain trust. Um, the amount of time and hours and efforts and ideas that you've shared with us are invaluable, and I thank you for that. Um, and I just want to move back to the core services. Next slide. Next slide. We're talking about new paving approaches. OK. OK, so we're moving back to core services. And here's an example of new ideas that's getting us more for our dollar. We are working to get more roads repaved using a new technique known as partial paving. This means we pave only the travel lane and not the parking lanes. By doing this, we can increase the number of streets that we can pave. Cambridge is also using the same approach. I know some of you are not happy with this method, but it helps us stretch our resources so we can do more. We are still evaluating this approach, so feel free to reach out uh, and share your thoughts with us on this. Something else we do to be more efficient and cost effective with paving is coordinating the paving schedule with the underground utility work. If we hold off just a little until we get the, the utility paving plans from the utility company, we can shift some of the costs onto the utilities who are required to repave after digging. So our paving budget stretches further. Um, an example of, um, of uh, dedicated staff serving our community is uh, pothole repair. Um, 
So in the first four months of this year, we have filled um, almost 1,500 potholes. The av <laughs> um, the average pothole fills per year um, prior to the pandemic was about 5,000. So we're working really hard to get back up to that 5,000 potholes filled per year. And then um, I'd like to also share, we're on the next slide, please. Uh, the city was out front in hiring a rat czar, otherwise known as our environmental health coordinator some years back. You may have seen, I'm glad you're laughing because I don't always laugh when I, I see this. So you may have seen recently that New York City, uh, I got tagged a lot and sent emails, uh, just hired their first rat czar, I think it was just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, Colin Ziegler, I don't know if Colin's here this evening. So Colin Ziegler is our environmental coordinator. Um, he has launched our, is he here? No. Okay, no. well, he's launched phase one of our Smart Box program pilot last year and spoke about it at the fall meeting. The quick update is that it was a success with over uh, a thousand captures. Phase two of the program has been expanded to Union Square and Lincoln Park. We also continue to explore new methods of rodent control that does not use, I trip over this word, I'll be honest, rodentis, rodenticide. Can someone say it better than me? <laughs> okay, well, <laughs> and how to make them available to the public uh, through the residential assistance program, which also is an unusual but effective approach. You won't find a residential program like this in most communities, but we found that if you invest time in helping private properties where rodents are active, uh, it can help the whole neighborhood. We've had over nearly 300 residents apply to the resident assistant program this year through March. Meanwhile, we're exploring the expansion of the rodent control focus positions in our coming budget. Another core service area we have focused on is our legacy infrastructure challenges. We have an aging water and sewer system under our streets and numerous old buildings in significant repair. We have a network of roads originally built for cars, not people on foot or on bikes who need to keep safe. Somerville is not alone in needing to catch up. Like much of the country, our infrastructure and buildings have suffered for decades from underinvestment and deferred maintenance. My administration is committed to breaking this mold of underinvestment in renovation, repair, and deferred maintenance. But it'll take time and it'll take strong fiscal management to right this ship. So we are working with purpose to tackle these issues through thoughtful and sustained investment and planning. And we can not only look backwards at our leg legacy challenges. There, are new, there is a new layer of any infrastructure updates, where, which is our commitment to sustainability. We now must include planning for climate resiliency and impacts on our investments. Reducing flooding impacts through gray and green infrastructure, for example, is essential to helping protect our homes and businesses. We are taking on this monumental challenge via two core approaches, strategic planning and investment, and a new approach to maintenance. On the planning side, we have recently undertaken a comprehensive effort to carefully chart our new investment in our schools, our fire stations, our below ground services, our city buildings, and more. To explore that plan, you can visit um, our city website, somervillema.gov forward slash CIP. While we tackle the problems of the past and plan for the future, the city is, however, also taking a thoughtful and innovative look 
at how to make much needed improvements right now. We know that major renovations and construction projects take time and we need city infrastructure to serve the public safe, safely while work is planned and completed. So our capital projects team is currently stress testing equipment and assessing vulnerabilities starting in our schools. Somerville has not been doing this for the past 20 years. We started this this current year and we are committed to increasing systems monitoring and replacement. And this is just a quick look on the, this slide of in infrastructure projects currently underway or in active development, planning, and review. Somerville Ave utility and streetscape improvements, Spring Hill sewer separation, Somerville Ave Poplar Street um, station construction, Powderhouse Boulevard and Alewife Parkway intersection, Pearl Street reconstruction underway. We just submitted letters of intent to the Massachusetts Building Authority for the Brown School and the Winter Hill Schools to begin the process of either renovation or rebuilding. We also just released, uh, as was said earlier, a bite network plan which accelerates investments in Vision Zero infrastructure. And finally, there's Highland Ave sewer separation and streetscape redesign. But as we do these core service work investing in our physical resources, I want to close with a brief overview of additional work we are doing in Somerville to invest in our people. Uh, and here's um, some of our recent successes. We've upped the Climate Action Plan, and we've launched um, a, an update to this plan this week. Last year's budget had a historic 10% increase in the schools, which was very important to me, and it's now serving uh, our youth in multiple ways. We've issued a comprehensive community survey to inform our ADA pl uh, planning. We've developed protocols and opened our first ever emergency overnight warming center for our unhoused population this winter, this past winter. We've expanded staffing and services for our LGBTQ, um, um, in LGBTQ services, language justice, racial, social justice, and in-person outreach in the community. And we've pushed our funds to small businesses to help them recover from the pandemic. A few things coming up next include we are, ready, um, we are starting to get ready to open a day center for unhoused um, persons. We are preparing to launch a universal basic income pilot. We're moving towards opening Massachusetts' first supervised consumption site to prevent overdoses. We're launching a new gender wage gap effort to take on wage disparities with low income women and their families. We supported strategic planning for the Women's Commission. We're launching strategic planning for multilingual services at, as well. So that's it for right now. <laughs> Thank you for listening. And I can take a couple of questions now. And as the other presenters uh, come up after me, they'll take a couple of questions. But there will be a big Q&A at the end also. Does anybody have a question right now? Yes. Um, on Long Street, I, I was on a, a narrow one-way street, so I parked on one side. Now, when they came in and put in the uh, new gas lines and stuff, they had their equipment all over the street and they kind of chewed it up. When it came to pay, they only pay one side of the street. And so we have a half of our street that's new paving, and the other half is chewed up. It's like gravel, and it's never been fixed. I was wondering if there's a way to write into the scope of work for some of this work that's contracted out that when they work in an area, if they're driving their trucks over an area where they're not exactly digging, that they extend their pavement 
and save the entire street instead of just a little strip and then just leaving the rest of it? Thank you for the question. I'm going to defer that one, but I think, Brian, you probably need to come to the mic so everybody can hear you. Uh, thank you, everybody. I'm Brian Polstoy, Director of Engineering. And I'll, for those who didn't hear her question, I'll repeat it very briefly. Um, they had a gas line that was reconstructed on their street. And uh, though they did a trench patch over where the gas line was located, the construction work chewed up the remainder of the street. And she believes that the remainder of the street should be repaved by the gas company. Um, I'm just taking you at face value that you're correct and that I would agree. Um, OK, what the, why don't you get with me after the meeting so we can look at this one in particular and have an inspector go out to it. But yes, we do require contractors, both, um, both private and city contractors, to uh, repair the street to its pre-construction condition. We do have a, a certain set of objective rules to that. Um, and usually the trench patch around the gas line is sufficient. But yes, sometimes the contractors are a little um, less diligent and tear up the pavement more than they ought. And we can work with them to re remedy that. My question was, though, could you in the beginning uh, add that into the project, like yeah, into the scope of work, that like the street as a whole is put back in a decent way, so, not just patched. Yeah, so this, these are private utilities, and we only have a certain amount of control over what we can require them to do by state law. Um, so we maximize that as much as we can. But if they're only doing a gas line, we can't just carte blanche require them to pave the entire street. We are looking at other tools that we have available to us. But um, it would require uh, us, the city, actually doing a certain amount of paving also. Um, so we're trying to figure out what tools we have available there. Well, could the city coordinate with them then? And when they come in with their trucks and do, then the city come in and do the rest of the street. Yeah, that, so it's all done. Right. That, that's part of what we're looking at to see what we can do. Um, but we also, at the same time, have to, have to be very judicious in our paving dollars so that we're not leaving other streets that are even worse off unpaved while we do those streets. So there is, there is a lot of data that goes into this to making sure that we're using our limited paving dollars most efficiently so that we're maximizing the streets that we are able to get paved. Thank you, Brian. Um, do you have another question? Yeah, I've got a question. Um, oh, sorry, somebody is Oh, no worries. Um, it's actually just a question about one of your slides. On slide 28 about your revenue changes, um, I noticed. Yeah, could I just ask you to use the microphone? That way the camera can uh, take this for recording. Everybody can hear it then. Thank um, you. I just have a question about slide 28 about how the revenue changed over time. Uh, for fiscal year 2023, you have, we have 66% property tax, 11% local receipts, and 16% state aid. That's only 93%. What's the other 7%? Um, so uh, can someone bring up the slide? That's it, I care. Um, That's only 93%. Um, so I would say we also get revenues from our permits. Uh, so our permits can be building permits. In the last couple of years, we've got, uh, so last couple of years, I would say probably last five years, we've gotten anywhere from um, 8 million to 20 million because we've had so much building. But it's usually the permit revenue that takes up that difference. There's other little things, but these are the big categories. Okay, I was just, I was Thank just curious you. Th thank you for the question. <laughs> we were trying to zoom out and be a little bit more high level, but I, I appreciate the question. We're gonna go right here. Yeah. Hi, just just <clears throat> just curious. Uh, you mentioned uh, buildings and the Brown School, and uh, which is in Ward Six. Just wanted to ask what more some more specifics on that one, if you know them. Uh, 
So we're looking at, I don't have uh, specifics. What I can tell you is where we are in the process. So outcomes on what's going to happen. No, we don't have that. We're in the data collection phase. Do you want to answer that? So we're in the data collection phase. Is what is our projection for student enrollment going out? We just got that back. We're doing a then, uh, ca no, what is it called? Like. Capacity, need. so our space, you know, what does our space hold? And then we're trying to sync the space with where we see our future uh, enrollment to be and then figure out what is the gap. And we're doing that all now. But Melissa is the director of uh, capital projects, so I'll let her add some more. Sure, thank yeah. you, Mayor. Hi, everybody, I'm Melissa Woods. I'm the director of capital projects, and thank you for the question on Brown School. Um, we're currently doing a K through eight master plan, um, and the mayor detailed a little bit of scope for you. Um, we've uh, are working closely with SPS. Uh, they've uh, have draft enrollment numbers and are working with the school committee on finalizing those enrollment numbers and those enrollment projections over the next uh, decade or so. And then uh, we are working on an existing buildings assessment. Uh, and then capacity planning, which how much space is in our current schools, uh, and then uh, what, how do we rationalize those two numbers in terms of accommodating our uh, future school population, and uh, in particular, uh, addressing space for our special needs students. Uh, our planning work will uh, wrap up right about the time um, of our the end of our budget year. Um, so. June 30th of this year, and then uh, we'll pivot with the outcome of that study um, to advance design and uh, have community processes around uh, either substantial renovation of uh, some schools or uh, new construction. So thank you. If you want more detail on that, the, the, the City Council's School Building Committee uh, committee at a meeting last Monday, May 1st. Um, and Rich Raish and uh, folks in the administration did a presentation on schools overall, but talked specifically about that process with the Brown and the Winter Hill. So there's some more detail there. It's available on the city council website. You can watch the video and like, there's some slides there too that give a little more detail. Good. Thank you. Um, we have one final question here before we move on to the next presentation. Okay, great. Hi, I'm from Champanella. Hi. Hey guys, a lot of residents there want to know what's going on. Hold on the, the mics. The, the store from mics all the way down. Are you going to tear some of it down and build stores up, um, buildings up top? Um, so there is some development. So I'm sorry, you, I, I didn't hear everything about your question, but you're asking what is happening in terms of development? Yes. Above Mike's or uh, Elm Street yeah, to well, they the bird. They're going to keep bikes, but the other stores they're supposed to get rid of uh, built buildings up top. I was wondering if that's true. I'm. Are, are you t the Burren area? And McKinnon's. Um, so that, uh, I don't know if Lance, I, is Tom here? Uh, so just at a high level, there is a property owner there. There has been community process um, uh, for building uh, a commercial building there. And uh, I can't tell you specifically what's happening on the, the ground floor commercial, so I'm going to punt to you, Tom. Can you grab a mic? Or? Yeah, maybe come on up here. Sorry, folks, I was caught in the hallway, so I didn't get a full sense of what the question is. But it sounds like it has to do with the status of the SCAPE project and the Asana project in Davis Square. Yeah. Yeah. SCAPE in the particular above um, uh, the burn. Oh, yeah. OK, so and SCAPE. And what's happening on ground floor. I think it's because Sligo. Oh, I see. Yeah. Everybody saw the news just the other day of Sligo announcing that they are closing, um, which uh, is very disappointing, but uh, it's a reality. Um, that project was permitted about six months ago. I think it was permitted about the same time that we met at the last uh, fall community meeting. And uh, so that they received approval from the planning board, so they're able to do their uh, lab development above with retail on the first floor. And for those who are aware and who, those who are not, their plan was to um, 
preserve one of the storefronts. Um, now I'm up in front of everybody. I forget the name of the other um, the bar, the Burren. Thank you. So they're going to they're going to build over the Burren and save that building, which is a very ambitious uh, project to keep that building there and then build above, demolish everything else around it, and build an entire lab building with retail on the first floor, basically around um, that structure. Um, we've been working closely with them um, over the last couple of years since they thought about doing a project there. And most folks remember they wanted to do residential above uh, previously. And so we've been always been concerned about the status of the first floor retailers to make sure that these small little neighborhood businesses, hopefully that are an important part of Davis Square today, might be an important part of Davis Square in the future. And so they have been in touch on a regular basis with their tenants, not surprisingly, um, to let them know what's going on with the project and to think about opportunities for um, coming back to the development. Of course, if they're doing an ambitious lab building and they have to basically knock down the entire building except for that one portion they're keeping, um, that's going to require some relocation of those tenants. They'll have to find a temporary spot somewhere, and hopefully there's the opportunity for them to come back in. But the reality is, you know, that construction is going to take 18 months to two years. So we anticipate that many of those retailers and restaurants might decide their temporary location might be really attractive and they might want to stay there because it's a huge undertaking to move your business to another location. Anybody who's done any move in their life knows how um, frustrating and how all-encompassing that can be. So, um, but our economic development team and you know Ted Fields is in the back here who uh, is actually uh, working on this and similar uh, pro uh, projects across the city. We're staying in touch with those uh, small businesses you, you've also seen that some of the businesses haven't reopened recently or in, a, in the last year or two since the pandemic. Many of them are still getting back on their feet and some of them haven't quite make it, made it. So you've got the macaron place that uh, I don't think is reopened. It's been a while since I've been by there. Yes, right, so they're not there. So this happens from time to time. It, you pick any five year period and retailers, restaurants, are going to find a different location, either be due to growth, and they don't have the space for growth, so they need to find a bigger space somewhere, or they find a different location that better suits their needs. And some of them just go out of business. That's, that's the reality. Okay. Great. Uh, thank you, everybody. So we're going to pass on to the next presenter. I'm here. We're going to have more Q&A at the, at the end of the meeting also. Is it Denise Molina Papers. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Buenas noches. I am going to make this quick. Um, as you know, the RSJ department always has a lot to share, and so tonight we'll be sharing a few highlights um, with you. The Public Safety for All survey um, officially closed months ago, and we are currently in the process of doing the analysis of the survey. What I'm happy to share with you is that this survey has received one of the highest response rates in Somerville's surveying history and is one of the most representative surveys Somerville has ever conducted um, due to the intentional efforts of um, the RSJ team and our outreach efforts to make sure that we were intentional with capturing everyone's voices in Somerville and their lived experiences. Part of what we wanted to share with you today is what the top five concerns are regarding public safety, not just in your ward, but in the city at large. So citywide, the top five complaints were people violating traffic rules or traffic safety, theft and burglaries, including car theft, shoplifting, stealing packages, bike theft, and pickpocketing, housing security, gun violence, and illegal drug activity. Specifically for Ward 6, um, the top five concerns were, are people violating traffic rules and traffic safety, theft and burglaries, again, including car theft, shoplifting, stealing packages, bike theft, and pickpocketing. <clears throat> number three is housing security. Number four is illegal drug activity. And number five was gun violence. So this is just a mini preview of some of the findings that we are currently doing analysis on in regards to the, the citywide study. Um, 
We also have the task forces that are officially in place. The Public Safety for All Task Force um, is the task force that will be taking the analysis and making recommendations around public safety in the city. These results um, will be shared with the community at large and um, we will be having similar kind of meetings in order to give everyone an opportunity to address the findings and concerns or any questions or thoughts they may have. I'm also excited to share that our Civilian Oversight Task Force convened for the first time about two weeks ago. We officially have 14 members consisting of subject matter um, experts, constituents, Somerville service providers, and they will be focused on defining and creating recommendations for a sustainable civilian oversight body for the city of Somerville. This includes um, the powers, the duties, the authority, the composition, and more for what the civilian oversight body would look like for Somerville. We are excited to get both task forces going. Um, and there will definitely be opportunities for you to engage with the task forces. They will be conducting listening sessions. They will be sharing out details of the work um, and updates on the work that they are, are conducting. And these um, listening sessions will be hosted by the task forces themselves um, in order to make sure that they are engaging the public and that they are um, able to give the public an opportunity to share their perspectives on the work and the expectations of that work. Um, we also have the Anti-Violence Working Group, which currently um, the due date for applications is May 19th, after which the selection committee will choose the constituents that will be a part of the Anti-Violence Working Group. This working group will also have subject matter experts and um, we extended the deadline in order to make sure that people had ample opportunity to apply to be a part of this group. They will be working with experts from the nationally recognized Urban Peace Institute to develop policies and initiatives or programming that will address violent crimes in the city. Specifically, we will be working with the top um, gun violence, gang, and domestic violence in the city. Um, part of the importance of this work is that we are able to capture the lived experiences of the groups that live in the city that experience these kinds of acts of violence the most. Um, and it's important for us to address the roots of the violence. There's no cookie cutter answer. And so that's why we have to come up with a working group that's really going to take a look at the data, really going to listen to the lived experiences of those who are um, um, experiencing this violence. And so to be able to take these broad voices and experiences and meet the needs of the different um, members of our community is why I'm especially passionate about this work. And I hope that um, you can all take an opportunity to look at the application and see if this is something that you would like to help us with. If not, again, there will always be other opportunities for you to participate because again, the RSJ department values very much um, collaborative efforts and making sure that the community is involved in the work that we do. Um, the RSJ Youth League has officially finalized their study on anti-displacement and gentrification and the effects of that on youth in the city. And they presented at the Harvard Graduate School of Education CPAR program last Thursday about their research on how displacement and gentrification is affecting youth in Somerville. Our, de our department is planning to host our Somerville community event to share out their work as well. And um, lastly, outside of their research part of their work, they are also going to be working on defining for the RSJ department what a RSJ youth cabinet would look like. And this cabinet would be able to give um, the youth in the city a permanent seat at the table where they get to voice what are the concerns of the youth, how they experience the city, and what is it that they want to prioritize as the youth of our city. Um, after they established this cabinet, um, as everyone knows, the Youth League was a one-year commitment. And so after establishing the cabinet, this will be a permanent group where they will be able to report out on what's happening with youth, affect change through policy and programming, and offer recommendations to the mayor and to city council. 
All three commissions have open seats this spring and summer. You will see more communication from our department on how to apply for membership. This is the Human Rights Commission, the Somerville Commission for Women, and the Somerville Commission for Persons with Disabilities. They are all recruiting. The seats will remain open until filled. And um, we have our ADA coordinator who is here today with the ADA um, community survey. So please um, take a look at, I think she has the QR codes. And if you prefer to have a paper copy, let us know and we'll get that to you um, as soon as possible. And thank you. Do you have any questions? Any questions for Denise? Yes, Harriet. Thank you. That was comprehensive, I have to say. Thank you, Harriet. Anyway. And I was wondering a couple of things. One is, I know that people who do surveys say that 10% is pretty amazing. And I just wonder, do, not that percents really indicate everything at all, but I was just curious if you know a percentage. <laughs> Um, I, can, I, I can't give you the percentages off the top of my head. What I will say is this, that we took census data and we took summer stat data, and we basically went through all the constituents and demographics that we have in the city of Somerville. We broke it down to what does that mean if we get 50% of, of these constituents, and we decided that we wanted to oversample in order to get empirical evidence to make sure that we're getting more than half of what each of our constituent groups are voicing. Um, but I can definitely get you those specific percentages. That'd be amazing. And the other question I had was, the two task forces, um, uh, are they already filled and complete now as far as membership? Yes, the Civilian Oversight Task Force is completely filled and so is the Public Safety um, Task Force. Um, Civilian Oversight Task Force has 14 members, of which um, I believe five to six are some of the constituents, and the uh, Public Safety for All has about six to six to seven constituents, and there's about 21 members in that one. And I forget the official name for but the uh, the anti-violence. The anti-violence working group is still is still accepting applications. Are there any other working groups? It flew by so fast, I might have missed it. <laughs> You know, that there may be in the future, <laughs> just because you know things happen and we can't predict the future and the need of our city. Um, I can say that if the RSJ department sees a need to, to create another working group or task force in order to get the job done correctly, that's what we'll do. For right now, we have the anti-violence working group, but I will make sure that you get a special invitation if we make another one. Thank you very much. <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you. All right, thank you everyone. Have a wonderful night. Good evening. Maybe this is a good luck card. No, oh, thank you. Uh, my name is Charlie Femino. Um, currently your interim police chief. Uh, I ser I've been serving uh, the city uh, since 1984. Uh, I retired. And my brief retirement lasted about five years, and I was called back in 2020. And uh, as many of you might know, they they have announced the, uh, the candidacy for a new police chief. So this will uh, be my last year with the city. I'm accompanied by Captain Jim Donovan. Jim is the uh, captain of patrol. He's the one who's the uh, direct liaison to the individuals in the, in the wards in the city. Uh, if there's issues uh, for deployment purposes, he's the one that I go to make arrangements for directed patrols for specific issues. Uh, you know, when I do these meetings, I, I often look at out in the crowd. Uh, in Ward 6 is unique in that there's many residents here that have been here for many years. And uh, you know, I have a, a unique experience in each and every ward that I uh, speak in front of. Uh, for Ward 6, I can remember standing uh, in front of the META station when they did the ribbon cutting for the opening of the red line uh, many years ago in 1984. I'm also sure that, uh, I'm sure that some of you in the crowd uh, were here when that was happening. If you think there's havoc now with traffic, it was back then when they were paving and redesigning Davis Square. Uh, what, I'm, what I'm about to do here tonight is just to give you a brief snap, uh, snapshot of the crime citywide and in, uh, specifically in Ward 6. 
Uh, but before I do that, I just want to make sure that you realize that um, um, with the Department of Racial and Social Justice, uh, the police department uh, has been working with, I've been meeting with uh, Denise Molina Capas since uh, the week that she started here in uh, February, I believe it was 21, on a weekly basis. And uh, we've, we've developed the framework of all of the task force that you saw her listing and that the uh, police department is, uh, you know, in collaboration with her department, working towards making policing in Somerville, public safety in Somerville, uh, a better place, a better, a better model for the city as the city continues to change and grow. So with that being said, next slide, um, just a, a, brief, a brief crime trend. Um, citywide, crime is up 7% um, over a year and 20% over two years. And what does that equate to? One of the things I like to say before we get into uh, the actual statistics is that percentages, as many of you know, can somewhat be deceiving. It equates to about 79 or so incidents over one year, an increase of about 80, 80 incidents. And over a two-year period, about 200 incidents. Uh, but the good thing is, is that uh, most of that elevation in crime, up the, the 7%, the 20%, is due to property crimes and not crimes against persons. Uh, when I say property, cr property crimes, part one crimes are the more serious crimes, your rapes, your robberies, aggravated assaults. There's a, uh, I'm not sure if you can see that at the end, uh, that there's a legend there with part one crimes, but um, uh, the property crimes that I'm talking about are motor vehicle thefts, thefts of parts from motor vehicles, uh, house breaks, commercial breaks, and uh, there has been a very, very small increase, uh, if at all, over the one year, uh, but over a two-year period in um, crimes against persons. In Ward 6 specifically, uh, it stayed almost the same, 4%, approximately 4% over one year increase, and 4% over a two-year incre uh, increase. And again, that increase is basically property crimes. In Ward, specific, in Ward 6 specifically, we're talking about uh, motor vehicle thefts, thefts from par uh, thefts of car parts, specifically uh, airbags and uh, catalytic converters. And it's not unique to some of them. I mean, this is a regional thing. Uh, we have a task force that's regional with our um, surrounding cities and towns uh, that, you know, they're going up and down the East Coast. And those are the types of crimes that are elevating our, our crime rate, both in the city, for citywide crime, as well as in Ward 6. Next slide. I know that we talked about having a gun task force uh, in, in the RSJ department, and uh, you know, I know that the topic of gun violence in Somerville is prevalent. Uh, this just to give you a snapshot of over the last, since 2020, there's been uh, 49 confirmed shots fired with over 300 rounds fired during those incidents. Uh, 12 individuals have sustained uh, injuries, uh, one being a fatality. Um, and one of the things that I wanted to bring out is that although that those are high crimes, one, one shooting is more than what we want. Um, you know, our criminal investigation unit uh, partnering with local, state, and federal agencies in, in collaboration with cities and towns around us that are experiencing the same um, um, violence, gun violence, have, um, have identified, located, and charged uh, over 30, 30 individuals. It's, that that number has gone up a couple of uh, since this slide has been made, um, but we've also recovered 40 illegally possessed firearms. And what we're trying to do as we move uh, forward with types of youth programs, uh, we've we've uh, engaged, and the whole goal is to engage with youth uh, so that they um, don't get involved with gang activity, so they're not affiliated with gangs. We've started youth basketball camp camps. Uh, we're doing some outreach, some dialogue sessions, not only with youth but with parents uh, so that they can recognize some of the characteristics of when their uh, children might be getting involved with gang violence so that we can try to steer them away from that. Next slide. Domestic violence and sexual assault, uh, there have been fewer incidents. I'm not going to go through this whole slide, but uh, the bottom line is, is that there's been fewer domestic violence uh, reports since 2022, uh, reported in 2022 compared to 21, and um, uh, six more incidents compared to 2020. 2020, both with sexual assaults and domestic violence, uh, was low, abnormally low, and we, we put that, attributed that to basically the pandemic year. Um, but one of the things that we want to bring out is that uh, some of the police department is a stop by believing uh, department and uh, uh, sexual assault uh, unit, uh, family services unit, uh, uh, trained individuals who are certified in sexual assault in investigations. 
In addition to that, uh, the important thing to know is, is that whether it's uh, you, you yourselves or if you know someone who's been a victim of domestic violence or, family, or uh, sexual assault, uh, you don't have to go forward with the report, but if you're looking for services, and we're going to have the next slide will show a number of mental health and domestic violence resources that are available to you. Those are uh, provided with the, in a handout at the back of the room, and that hand, that handout or those handouts are uh, translated in three different languages. So uh, please pick one up if, uh, if you deem it appropriate. That's it for now. Um, I'm going to be here with Captain Dunneman afterwards. I'll take a couple of questions if you have them now, and uh, we'll be here afterwards also for questions. How does the Somerville Police respond to mental health issues in an armed response versus an unarmed response currently? Currently, the police, the police department through a 911 call is usually the first response to any type of a call for an emerging person, mental health or otherwise. Uh, they make an assessment at the scene, the, the officers who arrive. Uh, we have a group in the police department, as you probably know, the core uh, group is a clinician group of about six uh, individuals. Uh, our officers uh, will respond if appropriate. They will refer to the core program. That's a mandated, uh, not mandated, it's, um, it's a box that's checked in our reporting system. Uh, we do about approximately 2,500 to 3,000 referrals uh, annually. Uh, and so when that referral goes over to the core unit, they follow up on each and every one of those issues, whether it's mental health or otherwise. Uh, and so that in conjunction with working with Cambridge House, uh, Health Alliance is the current response. Now I know that there may be some information out here. Uh, you may have some knowledge that the Somerville Police Department, uh, in collaboration with the Mayor's Office, with the um, uh, core group itself, uh, is talking about exploring other types of responses, specifically unarmed responses, alternative police response, and that is that has been uh, in the infancy of dis uh, discussions. And that's forthcoming, I would say, as a model, um, if that's what the community desires. That this is the whole purpose of what we're trying to do, that the police department, in, in reimagining public safety, if you will, is trying to listen to the community and, and explore different ways of police response or non-police response, an alternative to police response in the future. question I think is extremely important in that all communities are just one awful incident um, away from a tragedy like like what happened in Cambridge and I'm glad to hear that the police department will do what the city wants in terms of responding with non uh, with unarmed force or with additional um, responses. 
I wonder how it is that those of us who are concerned about that, very concerned about that, could be um, proactive in expressing our wishes that the programs that you say are underway really become realities sooner than later. So just to repeat the question for those of you who may not have heard, um, I'm glad to hear that the department is willing to and is listening to alternative response models in the future and how can we, uh, those of you who might be interested in that concept, get more involved. The, the RSA department has those task force, um, that's one way and that's a good way to get involved. Uh, and in addition to that, in the future there will be many dialogue sessions I would imagine over subjects like this and it would be important to you to attend some meetings like that and to voice your opinion at that meeting. One thing that this administration as a whole is willing to do, the police department in collaboration with the RSA department is willing to listen and the whole concept of um, you know, having a better model of policing for some of them, a community driven response is what you people think. So voice your opinions at the appropriate uh, forums and, uh, and, and there'll be discussions on those and, and whatever the outcome might be in the future will be. But thank you. Um, I don't know if they wanted to repeat the question. I got a sense for what the question was, but how do they become involved in unarmed yes. response? Alternative response? What kind of training is happening now so that we don't have um, a tragic incident here with, with police and um, a mental health emergency? And training for the police department? For the police department, I realize that's really not your, your role. Yeah, I'll let the chief answer that question. But, um, <laughs> I, I, well, one of the things that I did bring up, and I, I guess I think the focus of your question is now becoming so that we don't have an incident like what happened in Cambridge, an unfortunate incident, obviously, and hopefully that would never happen. Uh, hopefully that will never happen in some of them um, or any, any place. It's, it's unfortunate when something like that happens anywhere. But the point is, is that um, our officers are trained in crisis intervention. Uh, there's a, uh, a basic training session when they go to a police academy, but in addition to that, there's advanced um, crisis intervention training, mental health training, de-escalation training. We provide through the core program 40 additional hours of specialized training in, in crisis intervention. And right now, the department has about an 86 percent percentile um, um, attendance in that 40 hours. About 86% of the department has received that training. Um, that number goes up and down a little bit depending on attrition for officers retiring, new officers coming into the department, uh, taking that 40 hours. But we have a minimum of the um, basic training and then the 40 hours of additional uh, crisis intervention training. And we have many of our officers who have become uh, crisis intervention um, instructors. So we do, that's an annual training uh, that we take, uh, and so I would hope that that will help prevent an incident like that from happening. Um, if, if you want to know more information in regards to goals and objectives that the RSG department and the, the police department are working on, we are going to be hosting an informational series on public safety in Somerville. That is going to include what is the mayor's vision for public safety, what is currently in place for public safety in Somerville, what are the task forces working on, what, what are um, different versions of alternative response, unarmed response, co-response, what does that all mean? This informational series is going to cover the foundation of public safety so that by the time the analysis is ready to be shared out, we have sufficiently covered what is happening in Somerville, what is the data, what are the definitions of, and we can have informed conversations about what comes next for the city of Somerville and what are the needs of our constituents. What does that mean in light of what all of this is telling us? So be in tune to our social media. We'll put all those dates up for everyone. Oh, I'm sorry. And we're gonna have a TV show as well. <laughs> can I add to that real quick? Sure. Uh, 
Thank you. So uh, with apologies, oops, with apologies for, is this on? Um, I'm going to refer you to another city council committee meeting because that's where we do a lot of our good work. On February 27th, the Public Health and Public Safety Committee um, on which I sit had a, a, a entire discussion on this subject uh, with experts from around the world, both well, around the world, locally and around the country at least. Um, and the entire t discussion was on this. So if you go to this the city's website, city council meetings, look for public health and public safety on February 27th. Um, that video is there, and it's a, it's a long conversation, but if you're really interested in this topic, I highly recommend reviewing it. It's, it's, it was a really, really incredible discussion about what other communities are doing and what we might be able to do is just to get started, you know, in addition to the work that we're doing, how we can really, uh, you know, look at, at approaches that are out there and, and advance the discussion as, as quickly as we can. So. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Denise. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Aaron Franz, and I am a senior project manager with the Department of Public Space, Urban Forestry. Um, thank you to everybody for coming out tonight. This is just a, a remarkable uh, turnout, and I'm happy to speak to the needs of Ward 6 in particular. Um, our department, Public Space, Urban Forestry, is very much that. Our public space is incorporates so many different things. So it's, it's parks, it's schoolyards. Um, we have a lot to do with the zoning review of the new developments in the city, as you know, most all projects require um, a, a green score where we evaluate the open space needs of, of different projects. Um, but I think one of the great things that we've seen in the city in recent years is just this tremendous growth, and it's allowed our department to grow as well. So while we used to be a small, a smaller department, we now have six staff members. We have four people working on um, public space, and we have a good team, a solid partnership of two people working on urban forestry. So I'll uh, talk a, a little bit, and then I'll introduce Malik Drayton uh, to talk about uh, urban forestry. Um, so, but getting back to what uh, public space is, the first half of our department, I mean, we all see the trees and we're passionate about our green space and our open spaces and the needs within our community. Um, and that is, but that's, that is, and that's all very important, to, but sort of scraping the surface because we do so much more. And it has a lot to do with, we want to make sure that we're meeting the goals of our neighborhoods and the goals of our community, but we also want to make sure that we're meeting the larger goals and priorities of the city. And so much of that has to do with green infrastructure and, um, and sustainability. We have to build towards our future with those long-term environmental needs um, in mind. Always working for, you know, towards those goals for whether it's for a climate action or increased open space or the quality of the open space. Um, so, in, in this slide, you just, this is very much a big part of what we do. You can see we talk about tree canopy, heat, flood, habitat. We work with other departments in the city on the same things. We work with in partnership with mobility. We work in partnership with engineering um, to, you know, to make sure that our goals are, are parallel and we're working together. Um, this middle slide is, middle picture is an example of a project that we completed a few years ago. Uh, but is it a good example of the type of work we're doing? So this is Lincoln Park. So do you think of Lincoln Park now? You think it's it's a great open space with uh, you know large green fields? And what people may not realize as they visit a, a space like Lincoln Park is that um, when we planned Lincoln Park, we wanted to make it a very sustainable space. So Lincoln Park does not draw water from city infrastructure. We have our own you know, water resources within, this, within the park, and we don't put storm water back out into the city system. And a lot of that has to do with all the subsurface engineering and technology that went into it. So in this case, this is a picture of <coughs> what is now uh, the soccer fields. And under both the soccer fields and the baseball fields at Lincoln Park, we have this um, storm water capture system. So these are orange Caltex um, structures, and we are able to store, I think, over 185,000 gallons of stormwater in Lincoln Park. And that means that is not going into the city sanitary system, that is not putting a burden on the city to, to take care of that water. And so this is a good example of you know, all of our projects 
are trying to meet these sorts of sustainability goals. And I think in, in um, most cases, we have that ability. Um, and you know, one of the things that, as, as the mayor has, has, has spoken to in the past, we're really pushing for you know, what is a quality habitat and what's important for the city for the long term. So just having a priority, working on you know, incorporating native species whenever possible and working on um, you know, incorporating plantings that will draw pollinators into, into our spaces, increase, an increase in pollinator habitat in the city. And as part of that, one of the programs that our department is developing is the Somerville Pollinator Action Plan, largely driven by uh, the mayor's efforts. And we're very happy uh, that we're a part of that. Um, I'm going to introduce Malik now uh, to talk about uh, some of the urban forestry uh, goals. Malik? Good evening. <coughs> My name is Malik Drayton, urban forestry and landscape planner. Um, just to talk about our trees, trees and trees our open space are green infrastructure, and we want to make more of it. So we've committed to planting a, a minimum of 350 trees a year. And in 2022, I'm happy to report that we have planted 504 trees throughout the city. And since 2010, we have added, added 20 acres of open space. Um, so if you have any tree-related questions, I'm here. Um, <laughs> at, throughout the night and uh, you could approach me afterwards and for all tree related questions please feel free to contact 311 or for private tree related questions trees at somervillema.gov thank you I think yeah thanks Malik I think that that last um, thing that Malik said is important so if you have tree related questions though what is the contact information uh, trees at somervillema.gov. Trees at somervillema.gov. So please feel free to, to reach out and contact us at any time. Um, I want to talk about, you know, we have projects all over the city. As our staff has expanded, we've been able to take on more and more projects, and we have a whole range of projects. Within Ward 6, one of the projects that's been under development, and many of you are aware of it, is the renovation of the Brown Schoolyard. So I just want to talk briefly about that project. Um, the community has been very supportive of getting, you know, the Brown Schoolyard renovated, and um, we have that project in queue. Whenever you're working on a schoolyard project, you want to make sure that you cause the least amount of disruption to the school. So we have the project queued up. We have a contractor selected under contract. That project will start um, June 20th. Um, school gets out June 16th. Um, the following Monday is Juneteenth, so it's a holiday. So our contractor will start the renovation of the Brown Schoolyard on June 20th. And it's a tight schedule. We have them starting on the 20th, and then they have to be done by August 25th in time for school, the new school year. So um, this, is a, this is the plan for the new school year. As you can see the outline of the building. The schoolyard is off to the side. Um, Issues at that schoolyard have been, this is a schoolyard that just requires a lot of running space. And so um, we, we have that. It is a new surface that we're putting in. We're taking out um, the old asphalt surface, making it level. It is not level now. Um, and making it so it will be ADA accessible. There will be a retaining wall, a retaining and seating wall along the property line where the tall fence is so kids can have that. As a, as a seating area, and there is going to be, at um, community request, there is going to be a small synthetic turf running space, you know, field in the front corner of the park on Willow Street. So that is the basis of the design. There are some great um, uh, surface graphics incorporated in the design, and we are keeping um, the two half-court um, basketball hoops, as well as uh, in the little alcove, that's in the back of the school of people you know I know that a lot of kids like to hang out in that space and they play wall ball so we have a wall ball um, court 
going in there. Yes, happy to. Um, so we've got a turf space here, right down in this corner here. Um, this is Willow. Here's Kidder Avenue. Here's Josephine on this side. So here's our turf space, basketball, surface graphics with court games. There's ADA access through the whole space. One of the things that the project also needs to incorporate is the storm drainage system within the park is not functioning properly. So we need to redo that. We're taking out the existing storm system, storm water drains, putting in two new drains, and taking that water and sending it out to Josephine Street. However, the sewer on Josephine Street is a combined sewer. And by city ordinance, you cannot have a combined sewer for new development projects. And so we are this in the gray area off to the side, right here, we are running a new separated sewer line from the side of the school up to the intersection with Kidder Avenue, where we're able to uh, tie into a new separated sewer. Does anybody have any questions? We'll, Malik and I will be around afterwards as well. Yes, Ron, go ahead. Okay. Um, this is about the community path extension. Um, along the community path extension, there is a lot of bare, sharply graded hillside, which I think is going to cause mudslides if, if you don't plant trees on it. What's the plan for that? I think the community path extension has been something that the city's been working on for a long time. And so if you're talking about the existing community path, I'm about the, 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 the GLX. There's also some sharp grades that, you know, I can probably... <laughs> Brad can probably help ans can answer that question when he comes up because the, the GLX project and the community path are within the mobility department. Right, but I'm interested in trees and, and you know, the planting and landscaping part of that, of that project. Ron, yes. I'll, I'll grab that for you in a second. Okay, yeah. Anybody else? Yes. Yeah, thank you. Um, I wanted to find out what the city's plan is for trimming street trees. There's a street tree that's touching my roof, and there's a heavy limb hanging over the roof. And I tried to get, I, I, last year I tried to get somebody to deal with it, and they said they're only doing emergency work, but if that branch falls on my roof, it is going to be an emergency. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. Um, please understand that tree trimming is usually prioritized by risk, and we have 14,000 street trees, and we are currently working with contractors to service all of you guys in a timely and, in a timely manner, in a, a timely and appropriate manner, so uh, please exercise, um, please be patient with us as we come up with a better strategy and, um, it's over a year that I asked about this. That's true. It, so I have been Understood. Um, we are working on increasing our capacity to service you better, and it will be done in due time, hopefully. We'll <laughs> Oh, um, what is your address? Um, I I will be I'll, I will be in touch with you to. Uh, try and solve your issue. Thank you. As I said, we're, we're, we are here afterwards, so please come up and, and, and talk to us about your, your, your tree. Is there one more question? Anybody? Great. Thank you very much. Thanks, Arne. Thanks, Malik. Thanks, all of you. Hi, my name is Brad Rawson. Like you, I'm a Somerville resident. I'm a veteran of this great community and this great organization. I've been serving our city for more than 15 years. I'm a proud parent of a public school student in our excellent several public schools. And for those of you who I know well for many, many years of community meetings, it's great to see you again. Thank you for taking the time to be here. For those of you who raised your hand for the first timers to the mayor's my speaker question, welcome. Thanks for giving us a chance. This is your community. This is your civics. And you could be a hundred different places tonight, but you chose to be here. So thank you. Our local democracy, our local culture, what makes Somerville special as we manage so many challenges really is about people power. It's about people giving government a shot, but getting involved, not just being out in the audience, getting on stage with us. 
So the team that I lead in City Hall is called the Mobility Division. We're a little team of eight staff that deal with transportation issues. We partner very, very closely with lots of other city departments. One of them is the city's engineering division, led by our great Brian Postaway, who you met earlier. One is our parking department, uh, led by an incredible public servant named Suzanne Renfrew. A third one is our Department of Public Works. It's important that our residents know that each one of these departments is on a journey of increasing its capacity, increasing transparency and responsiveness to deliver the most progressive transportation agenda in Massachusetts. Here are two examples. So good news is I've got two slides, four minutes, two questions, and I'll be the last one in this room until the good folks at the church kick us out, and then you can continue talking to me out on the sidewalk. I actually really love these meetings for those reasons. So two areas that our team is responsible for, two big picture goals. Number one, nobody should die on our streets. Traffic violence is unacceptable. The city uses evidence-based policy to save lives. Traffic calming treatments, curb extensions, crossing islands, protected bike facilities, and speed humps are evidence-based policy. And you as residents, generations of community elected officials, Mayor Cassiano when she was a counselor, Councilor Lance, Councilor Kristen, they have been demanding more from city staff, and we are delivering. Five years ago, before the terrible crash that killed Allison Donovan on Powerhouse Boulevard, on the front steps of the community school where my kid goes to first grade, we delivered like three or five traffic calming treatments per year. Now we're doing 50 or more, and it's because you have asked for them. We try to do this with empathy, with information, and transparency to make sure that everybody has the right information and can anticipate these types of changes, not only for construction impacts, but if there are other trade-offs Let's be honest, sometimes parking gets reprioritized for a safer street. Everybody deserves to have that information ahead of time. The best way that you can get access to it, a couple of resources on the screen right now. We have an interactive traffic calming map where you can see where we've been and where we are proposing to go. Chasing the data, finding out where crashes have occurred, thinking about where schools, public spaces, senior housing, Places of worship exist and prioritizing those locations. Secondly, a council has mentioned the newsletters. Can I have a quick show of hands? Does anybody subscribe to the Mobility Division monthly newsletter? Well, thank you, but folks, that's a pretty low response rate. So <laughs> follow the QR code. We take this stuff really, really seriously, in part because when we've missed the mark and when we've been doing projects and people have felt like they're going caught by surprise, we're trying to respond in good faith. We're trying to make sure that you have information. This is the best way to get it. You can get onto the website, you can actually look through archives of all the things that we've done over the last year or two as we've done these process improvements. So I'll be happy to answer questions about that topic, but let me move on to the second major mandate of our office. It is the full and rapid decarbonization of the city's transportation system. I don't know if you know this, but the climate plan that we've been working on actually is also evidence-based. And approximately 40% of our CO2 and equivalent emissions come from the tailpipe of local motor vehicles. Please don't misconstrue this as demonizing driving. We all inherited a system that is biased. It's biased in favor of suburbs against cities. It's biased in favor of automobile companies and petroleum companies against mass transit systems. These decisions were made 50 and 70 years ago, and we happen to just be living through them, but our community demands that we take action. As a result, we work every day with the MBTA to extend the green line, to make buses run on time, to put Charlie cards in people's pockets. And that's the other element of the commercials that I want to offer up tonight. Does anybody have a free city issue Charlie card in their pocket right now? Ah. Oh. All right. All right. Is it issued by the city? Is it issued by the city? Yeah. Awesome. Progress. You can sign up for them. If you think you qualify, Anybody who has a kid in the public school system, your kid gets a free Charlie card if they're grade seven through 12, and you as a parent guardian, if you have income qualified, you can get a free one as well. Any bus, any train, all year, free. Any educator or other employee in the public school system, free Charlie card. These are things that Mayor Valentine asked us to do when she came into office, and we're super, super proud of them. What we're actually been doing is having staff go out and tabling talking to people at bus stops, hand out flyers, walking to small businesses, 
going to school PTA type of events to get the word out. So please do spread the word if you think that you, your neighbors, or anybody else you know may qualify for these programs. We can't take it for granted, right? Um, our council has been super supportive, Lance. Um, we want to continue to offer these programs because, again, they're evidence-based, and our residents, our educators, our parents are telling us this is a game changer. My kids got a part-time job because they can get to Cambridge for free. Mm. I can make a doctor's appointment. I can get to the grocery across town instead of a more expensive one in my neighborhood. This stuff matters. Mobility is a means to an end. We don't do transportation for transportation's sake. We do it to keep people safe, to improve economic opportunity, to improve public space and environmental solutions. So I think that is my last slide, Grace. How do you take about two questions? You all been wonderfully tolerant. It is eight to ten, but again, I will be here at the last person's last question is answered, even if we have to do it out in College Avenue. Thank you so much. Hi, thank you. Um, my name is Emma, and I am. Two questions. One is about electric vehicles. And it's great that we have some stations around here. For those of us who don't have a driveway, and um, just wondering, you know, most of us don't have driveways, so I'd love to hear about plans for uh, increase in abil and ability to have electric vehicles. And the second question is about um, just the, the, the timing of the bus schedules for kids, for high school kids particularly, uh, 87, uh, does not get to school uh, <laughs> at the at the high school at the right time almost ever. So you either have to re be really early or you see a lot of late kids coming from West Somerville. So I'm just wondering about uh, how the city is working with MBTA to improve that. Thanks, Emma. I appreciate those questions. Let me quickly repeat them. The first one was about city policy and investment to support electric vehicle usage by our residents. The second one was about how we interface and work with the MBTA to make sure the bus service is good and reliable and also timed for realistic use, like our students' bell schedules. Um, so Emma, uh, Elise, uh, can you please raise your hand? Elise is part of our Office of Sustainability and Environment. Uh, so her de department is the uh, kind of point group on electric vehicle policy. Elise, you all are working on the city's first ever electric vehicle charging strategy, right? So Emma, um, let's make sure that either talking with Elise afterwards, myself, or emailing transportation at somervillema.gov, we can get you and others plugged into those. <laughs> 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 no, for real. Um, we, we've, got, we've got a couple dozen spaces around the city on public sidewalks, and we've got another half dozen or dozen in city-owned parking lots. But as we know, you know, society needs to transform this uh, in part of our infrastructure, and the city is working on it. I do want to caution us and make sure that equity continues to be an important part of that conversation. If electric vehicles are only available to high-income earners, we are not doing our job, and we will never back away from the need to make sure that buses and trains are safe and reliable because they move so many more people than any vehicle now to the propulsion system. So your second question was about bus service. We work every day. We have multiple meetings per month with MBTA staff. Just earlier today, the mayor and I were meeting with senior state officials. Just wearing, wearing a jacket. Um, and one of the common things we do is relay that kind of lived experience. The MBTA plans its bus service on a quarterly basis. They adjust spring, summer, fall, winter. They're usually planning about three to six months out in advance. And we are constantly telling them, hey, here's a challenge that we're experiencing on the Winter Hill School. Here's a challenge that we're hearing about Highland Avenue at the high school. Again, if you want to email specifically, please do. But that will simply amplify other residents' advocacy, our educators and administrators and staff. And we will continue to fight that fight and try to optimize those schedules. But I, I hate to be the sunk of garden party. The MBTA is in a tough spot, folks. We can't give up on mass transit. Cities need it. It's equitable. It's sustainable. We're going to get through this. But right now, they have a hiring crisis, a workforce retention crisis and they can't run enough buses to meet five years ago's demand, let alone five years from now's demand. I think you know, the mayor has been trying to make sure that she's extending the hand to MBTA and MassDOT, working with other municipalities to say, what can we all do? And something simple that we brought up today, Mayor, was a job fair, connecting our workforce development programs so that folks may have a, an easier path to become an MBTA bus operator. So we're in it for the long haul, but your specific question is something that we're actively working on. Thanks. So you keep 
using the term evidence-based. And I, I'd like to know a little more about what that means. Like, does it mean we got evidence that says speed humps work somewhere else or whatever? I don't want to drag the speed hump too much, but are we, are we tracking, what evidence are we tracking? And is that public information that we can all track it together and see what does it work and when it's time to run the speed bumps on? <laughs> so the question was about the evidence that we use to determine whether our transportation policies are working. And specifically, I think the question was about speed humps. Well, traffic calming. Sure, traffic calming in general. Grace, do you mind going back two slides, please? We have data uh, that can be linked through these newsletters. That was actually the, the showcase of our January monthly newsletter. It was looking back at all of the 2022 evidence that we've gathered. We count crashes. Um, we actually measure how many vehicles are speeding, both before and after interventions. Uh, we count the number of people walking, the number of people biking. There's a whole suite of evidence that we try to publish, and we didn't make this stuff up. It's based on national and international best practice. There's robust scientific literature, robust industry literature about all of these things. Um, so again, if you look up, I don't know, the National Association of City Transportation Officials, you'll find like libraries of this stuff in Somerville's approaches mirror the evidence that comes out of whether it's Boston and Cambridge, or whether it's DC or Chicago or Seattle. Uh, we're always just trying to rec recognize that you deserve answers. Are these things working? Are they solving more problems than they create? We believe the answer is yes, in part because our crash numbers are down over the time that we've been expanding this infrastructure. And when we think about the number of users, the risk factors arguably are higher than they've ever been. And our crash numbers, our bad crashes, are down even further. So again, folks, this is a dialogue. This is not intended to be too heavy-handed a sales pitch. It's one of the, on the question you asked. There's robust evidence. So has an interactive map and a dashboard in addition to these, these various presentations. And we'd love to follow up with you. So, uh, it's quarter past, it's 20 past, we should probably wind out, right, Victoria, you wanna take one more? Yeah, so we're gonna turn over to just general Q&A, so you're still welcome to ask mobility-related questions, but do know you could ask anything. Um, I'm gonna try and go to someone that hasn't asked a question. Oh, Victoria, while you do that, Ron, you asked about the community path, I didn't get there, so sorry. Right. 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 City is working to clean up the path. Those steep hill slopes, we can't have water flowing down them. Uh, so every day, Brian's team in engineering, my team in mobility, Louise's team in public space and urban forestry. Uh, we are constantly working with the team to make sure that we can reforest, re-green the tracks. However, I want to set expectations. The MBTA is worried about safety. They sometimes view trees as a safety challenge anywhere near their rail systems. As a result, the plantings that we do might be knee high instead of overhead high. So, but we're gonna continue working on this. The city has an awesome urban forestry committee um, and all sorts of, you know, kind of conservation commission uh, bodies. I don't know if you can terrace those slopes at all. Short answer is no, but long answer is we will do everything possible as fast as possible. Right, thank, thank you. Thank you. Aaron. I actually have a comment and question over there. Uh, my comment is, uh, I'm one of those two-year-old residents for some reason. Can I hear you? Can I hear you? Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. All right. So I moved to Somerville two years ago, and this is my first in-person meeting, and I'm impressed and overwhelmed by the amount of work that you're doing, and I think I have more of a com more compassion right now than I had sitting outside. That what the city government do. The second is my observation that it seems from that first comment that if you're doing so much, are you able to manage the core things that the city is responsible for or takes the responsibility for for all of the residents? Case in point, you know, like the conversation on the tree, there aren't enough resources to get to the tree that's falling for the last one year. We moved two years ago, and I didn't want to complain, but I haven't been able to get city pickup trash because even though there's an ordinance that says a seven unit building will get a trash picked up, but my calls tend to die somewhere. And again, not as a complaint and not just this data point, the observation is if you're doing so much, how do you keep your focus? Thank um, you. Great, thank you for the question. You know, in terms of uh, 
some of the basic service. We are also having some hiring issues uh, in specific skills. Um, so in our tree maintenance division, and we've also moved, um, uh, we've been in some uh, negotiations with moving uh, staff from, I think it was DPW, this was sort of before my my time from, from DPW over to the Parks Department and we're trying to do it to a maintenance. So some, we're working on it, some of it is specific to the skill set and the jobs that we're trying to um, fill. Um, uh, another example is a couple of our ISD inspector positions have been open for over two years because we haven't um, been able to fill them with the skill sets. So what we've been working on is trying to restructure and do workforce development training to try to build the capacity uh, in-house. So some of that on the basic services, you know, in terms of trees, it is we, we can't always fill uh, those jobs, so we're trying uh, to tackle it. And so the second question was about the... From the observation that how things fall through the cracks, like our trash experience or the Yeah, experience. I, uh, I can't answer that. What I would ask is specifically, I'm happy to look into it. Um, uh, I, my understanding is how the system works. If you're a, a seven unit building, it might go to 10 units, you can apply to to get the city to open it. Why that didn't happen, I can't answer. What I'd ask is share your address with me and we'll look it up specifically and give you the specific answer. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, I have a question regarding the speed bumps. Okay. In, in okay. particular, Great. I'm familiar with the ones on Potterhouse Boulevard, Kidder Ave and Morrison. My problem with them is you can't see them. Even when you... I would suggest that you paint the whole thing one color, a bright color, bright orange, green, red, purple, whatever it is that you can see, especially at night. You can't see the thing. The thing. So I would suggest that. Uh, thank you for the comment. I'll let Brad answer it. I agree with you. <laughs> Thank you, and I'm sorry that it's been a tough year where we couldn't line up contractor A and subcontractor B. Contractor A does the asphalt work, contractor B does the pavement markings, and some of those speed humps were built right at the end of like September, October, November, and we simply could not get the striping contractor last fall. As a result, this winter, it was worse than it should have been. I'm happy to report that as of the last month, the subcontractor has been out painting extra yellow lines. There are signs up next to all of them, and I think, Brian, about three quarters of them have been figured, um, painted with those extra yellow lines. So Morrison looks good. Kidder has one or two that still need to be painted. But yes, we are constantly trying to evolve our standards and tighten up that gap between insulation not, and signage. Excuse me, I'm not talking about lines. I'm talking paint the whole thing. Yeah. So yeah. Come yeah. On and those lines fade, especially the white paint. They fade very quickly. And you have to see these things at night. I drive down Morrison quite a bit at night. I know there's four or five of them, and you still have to go slow. Those signs are useless because they're right two feet in front of them. And if you're looking on Morrison and the car's coming the other way, you have no time to see the sign. So paint the whole, the entire pump, bump, whatever you want to call it, one color. So Great. someone can see. Great feedback. Thank you. We're constantly trying to improve this process, and I, I hear you. I just actually want to make an observation. Um, I really want to applaud the Chief of Police and RSJ. I think you guys continue what you're doing. I think it's important. And let all the other departments see what they're doing. So I see some of the other departments. Parking's not here, I guarantee it. Is parking here? We have a major issue with parking. They've never been to a meeting in the past 20 years that I've been here. It's honest, it's true. Um, keep up the good work, Chief. Keep up the good work. Denise, wherever you are, fantastic. That's all I have to say. Hi, um, thanks everybody. I have a concern about 
the lab that is going in in David Square, my understanding is it is a um, infectious disease lab or a bio a biotech lab of some kind, and it's in one of the most densely populated parts of our very densely populated city with young people all around, and it just strikes me as such a terrible, terrible location for a place like that. So what are we going to do to stop a major incident? So we look for somebody from our economic development group to answer that question. I know Tom Galgani was here. Ted, do you want to go? Tom, you're closer. Thanks for the question. Um, there are many different layers of approval that's, that are required, depending on the kind of lab that's being, um, or type of use, the kind of company, the kind of research that takes place in a lab. Right now, at this stage, those two uh, lab buildings that have been approved are just allow the use to be there. They can have life science laboratories. When eventually companies decide to sign leases and they are required to go through a process through the Board of Health to tell us exactly what kind of research they're doing, what kind of um, work they're going to do, what kind of research they're doing, so that we have an understanding. And then we have to hold them to very specific standards in the building code and the health code uh, to make sure that whatever they're doing is not something that's going to impact people. So we got a long way to go, and we have no idea what kind of um, companies and what kind of research they might contemplate. But there's an approval. There's a further approval process that's necessary. Does that make sense? The, the city is also standing up a committee. The city is standing up a biosafety committee to review those things, a, a community committee. And I know they're taking applications. So. So the, the, the city is standing up a biosafety committee to, Thank you. to review those at community committee to review those applications. Uh, they're looking for subject matter experts, and they were also looking for community uh, involvement. Uh, Colin Ziegler, I think, was in charge of that. So if you're interested in being on that committee, I don't know if the spots are still open, but they were as of a few months ago. Yeah, it's a standing committee, and this is the group that does review those applications. So we've got experts from Tufts University. We have experts in the community. Uh, we have folks like uh, me. I'm on the you know I, I run OSPCD, so the planning perspective is there as well. And we're looking for some community members as well. Thanks for pointing that out. Thank you, Tom. Um, we're almost at eight thirty, so we'll just take a couple more questions. Um, Mayor. Yes, this is on the same topic. Um, I was very impressed at the big spike in commercial new growth. A lot of that is biotech led, and that is due in large part to the professionalization of administrative services in the, in the city, especially inspectional services, and the assessor's office. Uh, I wish I could say that the biotech safety team was up to, that, up to that professional standard. It is not. The city has not yet appointed its own representatives, so that two of the last four meetings of that committee had to be adjourned for lack of a quorum. Um, it, there is a very capable citizen representative who also sells into the biotech community. If he uh, reported his customers, he would have to recuse himself, and there could be no quorum. Uh, I think this is an area that really needs shaping up, uh, and the legislation as well could use a little tweaking. I should say that I've attended uh, all the biotech meetings, and the key area is BSL-3 labs. This is labs dealing with tuberculosis and other airborne uh, biological agents like COVID, influenza, uh, attenuated anthrax, and so forth. I agree with you, they have no place in an urban infill area, that they may have a place elsewhere in the city. Uh, Mayor Valentine, um, you you mentioned that there have been some adjustments to the Climate Forward Plan, and I would like to hear more about that. So, um, I we haven't we've released um, um, 
uh, or we're um, re upping it up. So I would just say I think there's a committee that is going to be uh, uh, forming or in the process of forming and we're going to be looking at our Summer of it Climate Forward Plan this year. But it's just started uh, to launch. We don't have any updates to share with you. I hope that we will by the, the fall. Thank you. Thank you. We are at 8.30 so I will take one final question um, in the back. I'm just trying to get to folks that have not spoken yet. Yeah, I just, I mean, we have two, maybe three major redevelopments coming into Davis Square, and I was hoping that we'd get a little more information on that tonight. Mm -hmm. And I just really feel like we can have a bit more community process going on with these developments that are coming in. It seems like people don't really know a lot about what's happening, and I just think development's better when the community gets to shape it. And I mean, we had a really mm -hmm. landmark community benefits agreement in Union Square which ended up getting a lot of benefits that the developer wouldn't otherwise have given. So, um, I mean, I would really like to see something like that happen with the Davis Square redevelopment to the amount of development that's coming in now. Can you talk about the community process that was around it, and maybe Tom? So I'll, I'll touch on the second part of that because it's, it's dear to my heart and I completely agree um, and I defer to Director Galagani on any further update. I know you talked a, bit, a little bit about the, um, the escape project but the, the song on the other side of the street didn't touch on. So we recently in the Committee on Legislative Matters went through our, our community benefits ordinance and really we worked it um, with a lot of input from the folks from the Union Square Neighborhood Council to try and make it more simple. Um, to try and pull out a lot of the you know red tape and and uh, things that were that we feel like were perhaps um, creating challenges because we just aren't seeing other neighborhood councils wanting to form. So I would love to have a conversation with anyone who wants to form a, a community council, a neighborhood council. You know that said, the 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 reason that the Union Square Neighborhood Council was so successful was it wasn't shaped by city councilors. Yeah. It wasn't shaped by the government. It was a, an yeah. organic community organization that came together. I think that's a critical aspect of it. We've tried to create the platform for that to happen. So um, I'm happy to point anyone towards the ordinance, towards the regulations, or the um, you know the the requirements that are that are now uh, that are now there. That does give it, it, once a neighborhood council is recognized um, by the city, there are actually enhanced rights that that uh, come along with that in terms of having conversations with developers. That said, um, both of the projects on Elm Street, uh, there's a robust community process that's required by the zoning, and we actually had several more meetings than even were required um, under the zoning because of the, sca the, the scale of those two projects. Um, Director Galagani, if you could come up, just talk a little bit about the the um, the covenants that that so covenants are uh, contracts that the city signs with developers. City councilors are actually legally prohibited, I'm told, from participating in that. But I have lots of conversations with Tom, and the planning folks are at those meetings and were at attending all the meetings for the two uh, Elm Street projects. And uh, perhaps you could talk a little bit about how how the community um, feedback was reflected in, you know, the, the those two projects, what's in the covenants, and and kind of how that sort of all came together. Okay. Thank as you. well as an update. Sure. So, so there are two, two projects, projects in Davis Square that we're, most of us are familiar with. Both have been fully permitted from the land use committees, so planning board, zoning board, etc. Um, you've got uh, the skate project that's on the corner of Grove and, and Elm Street. Um, it's been permitted. We don't know when they're ready to start construction. We don't know. The second project is uh, um, the Asana. We call it the Asana project. They're calling it the spoke the, uh, the, the six spoke seven, project, seven, 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 we have seven spokes now, the seven spoke project. Um, uh, they, uh, that is a multi-phase project. Part of the project is already underway. They're renovating the, the post office, the building that contains the post office that they acquired. Their next phase, a more ambitious phase, will be to go vertical uh, on the, uh, the building across the, uh, uh, the plaza. We don't know when they're gonna start that. It's been fully permitted from the land use committees, from the land use boards. We don't know, they haven't pulled the building permit yet. So those, that's the status. Um, we have high expectations as a community, and we ask our developers to do more and more each and every year. And the state gives us uh, latitude to be able to ask for things and write it into our zoning code. And then there's a whole court, um, group of other things that we can't really ask for officially. And what we do is we strongly suggest that they, they and we encourage them 
to uh, make voluntary contributions and do different pots of money that we've set up and created as a to hopefully to um, mitigate some of the impacts of their projects. And so we're asking for money in different pots of money and in different covenants. We've had community benefits money. Uh, we've had offsite infrastructure money that we collect and in some cases uh, collections uh, to, imp and to help us connect projects to transit, a green line fee for projects that are near the green line. And we've collected a little bit of dough from folks near other transit stations in the city. What we decided to do based on some of the public feedback um, for the two Elm Street projects is to try to put those pots of money together so that we can hopefully forward fund and accelerate some of the work that everybody I shouldn't say everybody, a lot of people are interested in is that that is the pedestrianization of Elm Street. And so we've, we've uh, signed covenants and when they pull building permits, we'll start to collect some money that we can use, we envision, to, do, to pay for some of the advanced design and some of the community process that we know we're gonna need to do in order to pedestrianize Elm Street. Does that make sense to folks? Mm -hmm. Does anybody have any questions on that? Could you explain that again? You said it was a voluntary Nation. Yeah. Did you this, just give an example of what this, that did and how it was used, like the benefit of it? Well, we haven't collected any money yet because it's all contingent on them starting their project officially. And when we pull the building permit, we get a certain amount of money, <laughs> meaning we, meaning the city, all of us. And then um, when they get their certificate of occupancy, we'll get the second half of the money that we've negotiated. I see you. Yeah, Gentlemen, real quick, yeah. um, I just wanted to ask you, do you actually uh, discuss anything with the renters or the leasers of the buildings in this area? As I go to McKinnon's, a bunch of us probably go, I ask them, do you ever get any contact from the city? Nothing. Well, that's... Nothing at all. That I, you know what? What well, I want to ask, have you actually gone in there and actually talked to these folks that actually have businesses, pay the taxes, have employees? Trust me, I go to every single business in Davis Square, and every single answer is, Zero communication from the city. I have reached Zero out to a number of the, the, the tenants. I, I can attest to that personally, uh, especially the Asana project. I, I worked closely with that developer to make sure that they were doing what we expected them to do, which is to be good landlords and to work with folks. Again, not every situation is going to work out. Here's, here's what's happening right now in Davis Square. Tenants are leaving. Leases are leaving. They get vacant. What happens with vacant properties? People break into them and they, they start squatting there. There's crime. This will continue if it doesn't get communicated to the leasers and communicate with the landlords. It needs to be not once a year, twice a year, constantly. Our economic development team is, has a regular rotation when they're reaching out to these tenants. I'd be very concerned right now about this, this development. Have a heart with these people that are actually in there every single day trying to earn a buck. We do two things. We talk to the developer and we say, what are you doing? How are you talking to your tenants? And are you making plans with them? Are you building a relationship with them, even though some of them may have to leave temporarily? And we also check. So we, and Ted, Ted Fields is in the back. He's a senior planner working on economic development projects. He and his team have been doing regular rounds to many of, the, many of those tenants. Sometimes you, you talk to the owner, and sometimes you talk to the manager. Sometimes the only person there is an employee. So sometimes it's not as consistent. Um, but I, I know, and I check, and I it work with my team to make sure we do that. Though. It all affects everybody equally, regardless of it's, a, it's just an employee or an owner. And you have to have that compassion with every single one of them equally. And I don't think the city is actually doing that. It's just my two cents. I talk to these people every single day. Every single day. And they don't feel that they have the support of the city. They don't. I hear you. Okay. I absolutely hear you. And I want the commercial business here. Trust me. Hopefully, it lowers my taxes. <laughs> That's all I'm really seriously. That really does help. But I don't think it'll stay. This will probably go up. Thanks for your feedback. Thank I appreciate you. it. Thank you, Tom, um, and thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, we're going to wrap that up. But staff is here and hanging out. If you have further questions, um, thank you. Again.